welcome to Beta Bagels number five um, with the Housing Data Coalition. Uh, today you are at Beta NYC uh, in the home of the Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer's office. Um, and today we're going to have a discussion with the Housing Data Coalition about how they're using open data across New York City uh, for housing justice. Um, the slides, if you want to check them out, are here at this, which is also posted around the room. Um, so quickly, just to walk you through the agenda, um, we're going to have some bagels and coffee, or we're having them. Um, we're going to have welcoming remarks um, from um, Adele Bartlett, who's general counsel here at the MBPO. Um, and then we're going to introduce you to the house members of the Housing Data Coalition. And um, they will give a really awesome presentation um, that's even going to be a little interactive and ask you some questions and get some feedback from you. Um, so please um, get ready to participate. Uh, then we'll have a short Q&A. And then we'll have a little bit more time for bagels, coffee, and networking, um, and some solidarity <coughs> announcements and um, the whatnot. Um, slides, um, as I said, are here at the Sitley. If you have questions and you don't feel like asking at the end during Q&A, feel free to post them at our Slido, um, which can be accessed at the Fitly um, as well. Um, and then there's hashtags and accounts for social media if you feel like Twitter tweeting. Um, great. So um, without further ado, yeah. this is Adele Bartlett, who's general counsel at the MBPO. Hi, welcome. Um, I am so happy to be welcoming you to the Manhattan Borough President's Office. As you know, a lot of us in this office come from the tenant advocacy community. I myself worked as a tenant attorney for more than 25 years, and it's extremely exciting for us to see the strides that have been made in, in both identifying, compiling data and its uses, and more importantly, what this means is the sharing. Um, and keeping it open so that people can come up with even more creative ideas of what to do both to protect tenants in place and maybe as we move forward to actually start being more proactive and not just defenses, defensive of our um, existing tenants. It's really exciting to see what you're doing and we are just grateful that we could in some small way uh, help you guys out and we continue to want to do that. Our relationship with Beta NYC is, is tremendously valuable for our office and we hope that we together we can all continue to help you guys because what you're doing is amazing and we can't wait to see even more. So thank you for being here and if anybody has any questions or you know need to know where things are just ask myself or Tara or Hallie and have a, a great productive meeting and thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we like to uh, point out where we are because uh, uh, we like to recognize the land that we're standing on. Um, if you've been to a Beta NYC event, you may have heard us discuss this a bit, but um, we like to recognize that the Native people who were living on this land before us were the Lenape. Um, and, in the, and it's important, we feel, to recognize the history of where we are and um, the sort of values that people before us held when they were living here and cultivating um, their civil societies. Um, and one of the things that was very important to the Lenape who lived here was this idea of um, not owning things. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's one one of the things that they say, in, um, I think, no, what was it? A, it's a, it's a, I don't know what the quote comes from. Uh, so it comes from this great book called The Island of the Center of the World, and it, which is like a legal history of the colonization, uh, the Dutch colonization of the Manahatta. Uh, and the Dutch were really, really confused by the Lenape's uh, understanding of land, uh, because to them, if you can't own the air and you can't own the water, how can you own the land? Um, and so the Lenape saw themselves as stewards of the islands that were on. Uh, and welcomed all tribes pretty openly to hunt, gather, as long as you were here in peace. Uh, and so because the Dutch didn't really seem to fire a weapon when they first arrived, they thought that they came in peace. Little did they know they were wrong. Mm -hmm. So in this same way, um, we see ourselves and um, our collaborators and partners as these sort of cultivators of community, of civil society. Um, and so. Um, we started Beta Bagels as a way to uh, sort of uh, execute that. 
that. So um, Beta Bagel started last year, um, or over a year ago, I guess, at this point. And um, it's an experimental breakfast salon series where we invite the public and government to come in and meet each other, learn about cool projects that are incorporating <coughs> open data or technology in transformative ways, um, and also just a great opportunity for people to meet each other and um, you know, uh, sort of cultivate new collaboration um, in New York City. So um, the, some of the core values that we operate off of as Beta NYC are the, these four freedoms, as we call them, um, the freedom to connect, the freedom to learn, the freedom to innovate, and the freedom to collaborate. So this is sort of, um, these are these values that guide each sort of prong of our work. So we have a civic innovation fellowship program that Emily leads, um, and we have, uh, we build tools with open data. We also foster community and collaboration through um, community events and partnerships. Um, and collaborations with government um, departments like the DOE, for instance. Uh, so before we get started, we just want to shout out um, a thank you to Data and Donuts, who was the inspiration for Beta Bagels. Uh, they're based in LA. Uh, so thank you to everyone in LA uh, for starting that and inspiring us over here on the East Coast. Um, thank you, Microsoft, who is supporting the bagels and coffee at this event and um, our ability to hold these events and um, the Sloan uh, Foundation, who uh, uh, is one of our core partners and funders. And of course, um, the Manhattan Borough President's Office, where we have a home and has been a vital partner to all of our work. Um, so without further ado, um, let's get started. If you have any questions, as I said, throughout the event, please um, throw them down in the live Q&A. Um, we'll get to them at the end. Um, and now I'd like to introduce you to the house members of the Housing Data Coalition. So the Housing Data Coalition is a member-based organization that came together to collaborate around open data for housing justice. And today we have three members who um, work at the, uh, Lucy Block, who works at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, and then Sam and Atul, who um, built a tool and are working now at Just Fix NYC. And um, both these organizations are really awesome, and they'll tell you more about them. Um, Just Fix is, uh, uh, is building tools for housing justice, so you can write letters to your landlord, you can respond to eviction notices, um, really supporting people and tenants to um, know their rights and um, take action. Um, and the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development is um, a coalition of organizations across New York City that are, you know, helping um, people make sure that they, making sure that people have a say in how neighborhoods and communities are developing into the future. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kate, for the great introduction. Uh, so I'm Lucy, which is Sam, and that's a tool. Um, so we are going to do like about a 30 minute presentation and uh, hopefully have 15 minutes to do a bit of a group, like small group activity. Um, so we are, NHG and the three of us are, and Just Fix are members of the Housing Data Coalition. We're going to talk a little bit about what HDC is and why we came together, what we do. Um, Atul is going to talk about uh, some of our shared database infrastructure. Um, and then Sam and I are each going to talk about how our organizations um, make use of that data infrastructure and also how we collaborate with HDC and how it's kind of core to the work that we do. Um, so I will start us off. Kate did a great job of describing what HDC is. Um, um, so the, we came together at first about three years ago. Um, and. It was Just Fix and um, an organization called HeatSeek, who were the main original conveners and organizers of the Housing Data Coalition. Um, they recognized that there was this problem where you had a lot of different folks around the city who were just like redoing the same work of cleaning up and joining and managing all of this housing related data in the city from HPD, from the Department of Buildings, from the Department of Finance. Um, open data existed at that point. This was like around like 2015, 2016. Um, the quality of open data and the availability was not where it's at now. Um, so like HPD violations, folks were getting from the HPD website and downloading in big batches. 
Um, but basically, everyone who wanted to work on a housing data project would spend months just like cleaning the data, and so they recognized that there was a lot of value in bringing people together, uh, doing that work uh, collaboratively, and one of the members developed something that became this database infrastructure called NYCDB, which we'll talk about later. Um, but just to go over some of the other things that we do, well first, this is, this is our value statement. So this is what we have all of our members now affirm before they join us. So whether it is somebody who represents a nonprofit or someone who comes as an individual, they have to be committed, they have to recognize what we see as the history of um, how data and mapping uh, have been used as tools of power to displace people and um, especially communities of color, uh, low income folks from their neighborhoods in the city and that um, that capital fueled real estate speculation continues this trend and continues using big data in that way. We see ourselves as working to counter that force and we do that by collaborating with one another. And so we ask everyone who joins us to commit to not using our work for profit. Um, even though some folks actually work at those types of places, they're like, no, I'm here as an individual, I'm here because I'm interested and committed to this, and I will not bring what I learned here back to my company to make more money. Um, so what we do um, is like we have two real spaces where we collaborate. One of them is a monthly meeting. Uh, the third Wednesday of the month in the evening, we get together and have snacks and do some like shared presentations, um, do working groups, and talk about collaborative potential like collaborative projects. Um, so we have folks who have been there for a while come. We have a lot of new people come, and going to a meeting is like the, the point of entry for joining HDC. And then we have a pretty active Slack channel that has, I think, about like 70 people on it. Um, more, maybe. More than 70 people, and it's a it's a place where people really get like quick um, help troubleshooting technical issues, or they're like, what is this field in this GOF data set? What does it mean? And somebody will know immediately, and people chime in, and um, and we share. It's, it's a good Slack channel um, or workspace. Excuse me. Um, so we uh, collaborate on projects, we share this database infrastructure, we really um, work together on that and then individual organizations and people build their own projects and tools off of that shared database infrastructure. We found that that ends up happening and making sense more than HDC actually like producing projects as HDC. Um, but we definitely share the learning that helps us do those things. Um, what else is on here? We do some, uh, oh, we've like started dabbling kind of in open data advocacy and um, uh, the Manhattan Borough President's Office and Data NYC have been like totally critical. I want to shout out Emily Goldman in the back who's helped us um, do advocacy to get uh, access to housing court filings data, which is um, held by the Office of Court Administration at the state level. They've been like protective and opaque, uh, and we actually had a meeting with them recently and like gained a bunch of ground on that, um, which is absolutely because of Gail Bruin, <coughs> because of Emily, so thank you. Um, yeah, did I miss anything important that we do? Okay. This is about our membership restrictions, but people aren't allowed to be crappy and make money off of what we do. Um, we have a website, this is what our website is. Sam worked on it a lot. A lot is a... <laughs> Okay, cool. I'm gonna hand it over to you. Okay. You have to stand here to be recorded. Oh, the big Sorry. blue X. Right. Yeah. Oh, got it, got it. Okay. Um, yes. So NYCDB is one of the uh, main artifacts that uh, comes out of uh, the Housing Data Coalition. Um, it's here on GitHub, um, and um, it is essentially a, um, uh, a sort of contrary. Well, the the the, the moniker NYCDB is a little bit confusing at times because it's not just a database, but it's also the uh, software that is used to create the database, um, which, wait, can this be used to? Yes. yes. Next, next, okay. Oh, nice, okay. There we go. Okay, so um, there's this question of like, why this tool even exists? Um, and basically like, uh, New York City's open data is really awesome. Um, and it's available as like these kind of separated values or the Excel spreadsheet files and sometimes in, in PDF format. Um, but in order to analyze it, we need to actually do something with that. Um, we often need to extract that data from those documents. Uh, we often uh, need to transform it to make it easier to use in some way. Um, and then we will often want to load it into a database uh, to make it really easy to analyze. 
Uh, and so this is sort of the kind of thing that um, when Lucy was talking about earlier, where some of these organizations came together and were just like, uh, every time I do this kind of analysis, I have to like redo this stuff from scratch. It would be so great if we just had a common resource that did this all for us so that we could just you know, get off the ground running and just start making queries to a database without having to do all of this duplicate all this work every time. So, um, an example of extracting data is mostly from this New York City open data portal. Like, fortunately, um, like Lucy said, we used to have to like, do a lot more scraping of websites and stuff, but so much is just available now as CSV files in New York City's open data portal that we, most of it we get from there. Um, there is some stuff that we still get from things like PDFs. Uh, a major example of that is that the Department of Finance sends these tax bills to um, apartment buildings every year, and in, buried in those PDFs is the number of rent-stabilized apartments in each building, and that information is available in no other open data source other than each PDF. So we literally have a thing where we basically have to fetch the PDF for every single building in New York City and search for this little piece of text um, so that we can get numbers on um, uh, on, rent, on rent stabilization. Um, and then uh, the second step of transforming data is um, it often can be pretty simple, but they're just little things to do to make it a lot easier to manipulate this data. And so um, if you're familiar with something called a building block lot number, it's basically sort of like um, the, um, the main thing in NYCDB, it's, it's, it identifies a tax lot. Often there's one building to a tax lot, sometimes there's lots of buildings to a tax lot, but uh, the important thing is that almost every single open data source has this as either one column or it separates it out into three columns, one being the borough number, one being the block number, one being the lot number. Um, uh, as an example, DOB job application filings has that as three separate columns. Um, it's really easy to, to cross-reference between open data sets when it's just one big number that you kind of like squish together with, with zero padding. Um, and so that's one example of transforming data is that we just take those three columns and unite them into this one number so it's really easy to cross-reference across different kinds of data sets and be able to ask questions like, oh, of all the uh, HPD registered buildings in the city, which ones of them have these kinds of DOB job application filings or something like that. Um, another example is that um, uh, some data sets like Pluto is, uh, is a big one, have geographic information, um, but it's specified in this New York Long Island state plane coordinate system. Uh, whereas lots of times we wanna just um, easily plot something on a map and a lot of the mapping software like Google Maps and Mapbox uh, prefers uh, coordinates to be in just standard latitude and longitude. So. Uh, another example of transformation is that we just convert it from uh, one of those coordinate systems to the other so that the people who are analyzing the data can really easily just put their stuff on a map. Um, and then finally, loading data. Um, HCC, we basically have, so we essentially have a Postgres actual instance so that, that we maintain. Um, it's freely accessible to any HCC members. Um, we give the login information, everything, once, once you join HCC. Uh, and we also, um, essentially, that, that piece of software that actually extracts and transforms the data, uh, it is completely open source. Like I said, it's on, it's on GitHub, um, and anyone can use it. Um, but to actually run that software to build a database takes a while. Like, um, if you're running it on a single computer, it usually takes like 12, 12 hours or something to fetch all that data. And then once you've fetched all that data, you've got the data for like that point in time. But if you were to like, you know, keep that data and a month later do some analysis, your analysis would essentially be using one month old data. Uh, and so it's, it's, you know, kind of a hassle to have to like, you know, have your computer running overnight to even build that thing and then have to like, um, rebuild the thing um, at regular intervals to keep, sure, keep it up to date. So in this communal uh, instance that we have, um, once you're given the login credentials, it actually um, auto updates. Um, and you can see here, this is just on our Slack, it basically says when it's uh, every day at midnight, it essentially checks all the open data sources to see if they're changed. If they are changed, it re reloads them into this database. So that whenever you do a query on um, our communal instance, you're using up-to-date data. 
Um, and then finally, querying the data, um, we have a communal tool called SQL Pad. It's a piece of open source software that basically gives you uh, a interface to write uh, SQL queries. It's called Structured Query Language. It's basically a thing that we actually hold workshops where we'll, we'll teach you how to write queries in it. Um, but um, uh, we es essentially, like, all you need is a web browser. Um, you can install a database client if you prefer such a thing, um, but just to make the barrier as low as possible to, um, to folks, we, we have this um, HDC uh, publicly accessible uh, website you can go to where you can just make the queries on your own. Uh, and then finally, we have some learning resources. Um, we try to document every data set that we have, uh, include like provenance information, like, oh, hey, we get this data set from this NYC Open Data Portal uh, at this location, uh, links to the data dictionaries. Um, and then we uh, also try to provide like example queries for each data set so people can get a feel for like what kinds of things they might want to do with a data set and how it can be used. Uh, we also have a glossary that was um, very much inspired by uh, some work that some uh, librarians who presented at the School of Data uh, earlier this year uh, did so that we can define common terms there. Um, and then, yeah, we also hold regular trainings. This is just like a little screenshot from one of our uh, uh, training sessions that, uh, that we put on the wiki. Um, and um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Cool. All right, so hi everyone. I'm Sam Robbie. I'm the research and data lead at JustFix NYC. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how JustFix as an organization uses HDC and relies on HDC and specifically also NYCDB, this, this database tool that Achul talked about um, for all of our, our um, purposes at JustFix. So, there we go. Um, so Just Fix NYC, we're a nonprofit and we build technology for tenants and organizers fighting displacement. Um, in that way, we're sort of, people think that we're a startup because we're like a small team of like developers and tech people and we're like building stuff really quickly and trying to test and iterate that. Um, but in a lot of ways, we're really not like a startup because when we're a nonprofit, so we're fully funded by, you know, like grant funding. Um, we have 501c3 status and then also like we're not trying to disrupt things in the environment that we work in and really we're, who we answer to is tenant leaders and tenant organizers. That's kind of who we consider like our boss and how we think about and develop tools for what we want to do. Um, and so we build a lot of different things that help out um, tenants more like self-help tools. So a lot of our products um, will help folks who are dealing with a lack of repairs or harassment issues with their landlord send a letter of complaint um, outlining all the potential violations that their landlord might have based off of the lack of repairs or harassment that they're facing. That also can serve as court evidence um, in a housing court case. And we also have a tool that's in beta testing mode now that allows tenants to actually auto-complete forms for housing court um, totally online um, and then just bring out those printed forms to housing court and, and serve their case there. Um, the tool I'm going to talk about first, though, is this tool called Who Owns What, and this is really our most data-driven tool here. Um, Who Owns What essentially tries to unveil all of the networks of property ownership that landlords have around the city. And so I'm sure some of you are familiar with the, the LLC problem, um, which is when, you know, you're living in a building and you try and look up your landlord in HBD and you basically see, like, some weird company name that is essentially, like, your address with, like, LLC at the end or something like that. And you're like, oh, yeah, my landlord must be really local, right? Because they, they're, you know, their company name is my address. Um, but then you go look at their business address, and it's in Scarsdale or something. Um, that's actually a problem that has been communicated to us through you know decades of tenant organizing and folks who have had to deal with this problem firsthand when they're trying to investigate a property owner. Um, and that problem was brought to us as something that was just really tedious and time consuming. You know, there was always ways, there, there's often been ways to try and um, link properties together going through, um, you know, official documents kept by the city and then later on through open data. Um, but that was always a very tedious pro process. And for someone who's working as a tenant organizer, just a tenant leader volunteering their time to help out with the problem, um, that's really precious time. And so who owns what essentially automates that process of linking properties together under common ownership. And I, 
I'm not going to show a live demo now, but I suggest I really want you all to try it and go to Who Owns What. You can literally just Google Who Owns What, and you put in your address, and it'll show you a whole map of all buildings that have um, have like a common owner um, through HBD Open Data. Um, and the cool thing about this tool is. It's totally built on NYCDB, this, this database that Natul is saying. So we're using the shared resource for this tool that we actively maintain. Um, and a lot of people who use it, you know, mostly tend to be tenant leaders and organizers who are either working with tenants in a building or are living in a building themselves and are trying to find other buildings and other tenants facing the same issues from the same landlord. Um, a lot of legal aid providers, um, Brooklyn Queens Legal Services, Human Rights Commission, um, those folks also use this tool to build um, strong legal cases against the landlord. Um, policymakers have also, you know, been advocates of this tool and use this tool, um, as well as journalists. So we've actually ha worked with journalists in the past working on a story about a specific landlord who have used this tool as a data aggregation method. Um, another use case for and, and the other piece about this tool I just want to talk about is that, you know, a lot of the work that we've done in terms of building out new features has also relied on the Housing Data Coalition. Um, and a lot of our partners have similar tools that we've linked together with. I actually just had a call with someone who works with Lucy to try and integrate um, the tool that, you know, Lucy's actively working on more with our tool to kind of make things more seamless. So all in this theme of not duplicating work, that is really how our development process makes use of the Housing Data Coalition community. Um, another project that was very much involved with Housing Data Coalition as well as this NYCDB tool was the Worst Evictors Project. Um, this was a joint project between Just Fix, um, the Right to Counsel Coalition, and the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project. And essentially, um, it was basically, we kind of call it like a Facebook of um, the top NYC evictors around the city using the NYC Marshall's evictions data, um, as well as a map that lets you look up all the evictions from 2018 around the city. Um, and it was a tool made in coordination with the Right to Counsel Coalition organizing team, along with a week of action that they planned um, around specific bad actors that they were focusing on. Um, and so the big challenge with this, the data challenge with this project was actually coming up with a way one, to clean, deduplicate, and geocode the evictions data, the Marshall's evictions data. That's data that is now posted on open data, but it, the address field is not in any usable format. Um, a lot of the addresses have other random keywords in it that make it really hard to locate. Um, it's not geocoded, so it's not linked with latitude and longitude or linked to a BBL code, like what a tool is saying. Um, there's also, uh, it was not deduplicated, so there, there were duplicate entries in that data that needed to be taken out. Um, and HTC, a lot of members actually came together to work on processing that data to make it usable for analysis. And that actually took about a couple months, but we actually got to a point where we were able to match more than 99% of those records for 2018 to a uh, BBL value with high confidence. Um, so that was the first step. And that, you know, that's something that we've now shared back with the community and is public as long as you're able to credit us. Um, the other big thing is then linking those evictions with um, landlords around the city. And that was something that I worked on as part of my position at Just Fix. Um, and that we, you know, was a, a, quite a daunting process. Um, but because we have this database that has all the data that we need, I was able to <coughs> basically write one really long piece of code that then I could share with everyone in the housing data community. Um, and get their feedback on. And I think I actually shared it with about like eight or so different members. I mean, Lucy looked at it, a tool looked at it. Um, and that's really important because obviously this is a real, this is something you really want to get right. And it's something that we're always trying to share open source. So we, you know, this is something that is now currently public. If you go to Worst of Victors, if you look up the Worst of Victors project, you can see the code that we wrote. Um, and people are, who maybe disagree with the, you know, the messaging of the project might want to be checking our work. Um, it's something really important to get right, and so relying on the housing data community, uh, housing data coalition members, um, was crucial to really feeling like we're getting the most high quality analysis out of this. Um, and then another thing that we do at Just Fix, something that I feel are these kind of one-off data requests. So we have you know, either just tenants who are coming for the first time to Who Owns What or to one of our products and have you know, a question about some piece of data that's not represented there. They'll actually email us um, and ask for specific pieces of data. We'll also have folks from the tenant organizing community ask us specific questions, legal aid providers, journalists, um, reach out to us with these quick requests. 
They almost always require um, making some kind of query to this database that Atul was talking about, to NYCDB. Um, and so that's another thing that makes my job a lot easier in terms of trying to answer these questions for folks in our community. Um, we've also had a couple of trainings in NYCDB specifically for tenant leaders and tenant organizers so that folks can actually start making these data requests in this system all the other, like on, on their own and not have to rely on another party to do so. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is just some challenges that we face. And I think these are, I tried to pick stuff that maybe would be relevant to folks in this room. Um, you know, as, as we've talked about, HTC was really built out of this idea of not duplicating work. You know, we're in a very resource restricted environment and movement. It's really not smart for us to be doing things over and over again when, you know, we don't have the resources to afford that. Um, I see that, I, I in some ways want to extend that to the city and city agencies. Um, one thing that we struggled with a little bit is that, um, you know, some city data portals are inconsistent. Um, a, an example of this was that we used to link directly to uh, a building's department, department of finance, um, <clears throat> department of finance profile on the DOF website. Um, and I think about a year ago, they did a whole overhaul of the website, made it look a lot nicer, updated it to make it a lot more user friendly, but they actually removed the direct link to be able to basically input like a building's BBL or address in the URL and go directly to that page. And so now there's, there's not a way that we can do that. And so if folks are on our tool and then, okay, I want to go look at the tax documents, they have to basically fill out another form specifying the address or the BBL to get there. Um, and that really upsets me, one, because that, that's wasting, you know, that, that's hours more time that like organizers are going to have to spend going from different place to different place. Um, and then the other thing is I could tell that the person, the people who are responsible for updating the website were really trying to do good. And I think they didn't realize that this was going to be a problem. So specific ask, if anyone knows the people who maintain that website, it would be great. I, it would be great. And I, I mean, like, I would be great to have a conversation with them, because I think this is stuff that we, we can be more coordinated about. Um, other stuff that we've dealt with is that evictions data is really messy. I mean, I talked about it, where the eviction data posted, the Marshall's eviction data posted on open data is not really usable for analysis, especially if you need to link that with, with buildings. Um, you know, and then also the filings data, which we're slowly getting access to, doesn't really have any public outlet, you know, so people who just want to look up how many eviction filings were filed in their building with their landlord just can't do that because that's not public at this point. So those, those are kind of the main challenges. Um, and that's kind of it for Just Fix. We'll have some time for Q&A at the end, but... Point it right at the laptop. Hmm? Hmm? Let's see. <laughs> Maybe it's the last slide. There we go. Oh. Okay. Well, sorry, Lucy, I broke the Hold broke on. the clicker. <laughs> Tech support. <laughs> now it works. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy, you are the magic touch. Magic tech support. Um. Great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my organization's use of all of the same stuff, our collaboration with the Housing Data Coalition, our use of NYCDB, um, and some of the challenges we face, although Atul and Sam have done a great job of um, talking through what those have been. Um, so I manage, I'm a research and policy associate at ANHD, and I manage what we call our Displacement <coughs> Alert Project, and you can visit all of these tools at displacementalert.org. Um, ANHD's mission is there. You can go to ANHD.org. But um, as Kate mentioned, we, uh, we're an umbrella organization of uh, neighborhood-based community organizations, mostly. And those organizations are working against displacement uh, on affordable housing and um, what we call equitable economic development uh, across the city. So uh, the Displacement Alert Project um, evolved uh, out of kind of this the same desire to um, for organizers in particular to be able to identify where displacement is happening in the city, um, taking advantage of the city's open data. It, this originated kind of in like 2014-2015 when open data was much less accessible and it started with something called DATMAP. So it absolutely, it was before I got to NHG, but the people who developed it, um, Chris, I don't know, did you work on it? No, okay, Chris Hendrick worked on it. So um, it was a collaboration with a lot of volunteers and like just getting together one of those giant databases because it's citywide, so you've got Pluto in there, and then we added in um, that regulated number data, the stabilization data, 
um, sales from the Department of Finance and Department of Buildings, and it used a lot of like Excel, and I think my former boss like broke a computer, like made a computer catch on fire somehow, <laughs> trying to like, yeah, work on this, so, uh, so it's a lot better now. And uh, so that's one of our tools, it's kind of, it's, it gives you an overview of the city, and then you can click on a property, um, get more information, some of the aggregate numbers, and we also have like four different kind of risk layers um, that are, you know, on a gradient so that you can identify where more stuff is going on in an individual property. And that is sort of like general public use, public facing, um, interesting to like students and researchers and journalists sometimes. Um, when I got to ANHD, I worked on the, the DAP district reports. That's really the first tool um, that I built at ANHD, and it was very targeted to tenant organizers in a, in a much a very similar way to what Sam is describing as the goal of Just Fixes tools. Um, and I built it like completely on NYCDB and um, another little kind of experimental tool that an HDC member had built, which uh, queried NYCDB, it's gonna be a little technical, um, uh, used SQL queries on NYCDB, uh, put all of that into a big JSON file, and then uh, ran a program to put that JSON data into like 59 different HTML pages for each of the city's 59 community districts, being like, what are the top 10 sales in that neighborhood? And so I built on that um, and created uh, these district reports, which, which use other data from NYCDB. So it's new sales in the last 30 days and buildings with five or more new HPD complaints and some other fields um, that through conversations with organizers, um, I found to be like good uh, indicators of risk of displacement. Um, but I was like, I learned Postgres when I got to my job because NYCDB was built on Postgres. I learned SQL because I needed to be working with data citywide and Excel was too slow for it. Um, so like every step of the way I was working with HDC and getting support from HDC and just like, I was able to build up my own skills so, so much just because that network was there and that when I ran into a snag with like SQL, I could just go on the Slack and ask people if they respond in like five minutes. So that was really great. Um, our newest tool is called uh, Dot Portal and we had um, an external developer build it, it's way more complex and it kind of like allows users to just get all records from all of these data sets in one place by typing in an address. And because it's such a monumental amount of data that we also need updated on a daily basis, um, our developer used a different, like created a different database backend for that, um, so, but like built off of a lot of the learning and understanding that we had from NYCDB and also like all of this shared knowledge over time among HDC members about what's important and what works and what doesn't. As Sam mentioned, we are um, we're working on having one number in here be like the the number of buildings we think the landlord owns with and there's a link to who owns what already. Um, and then there's also when you go to a building page on who owns what, there's a link back to that portal so people can shift between the two. Um, just to talk about some of the impact of these tools, um, tenant organizers use the DAP district reports to um, identify buildings that they might want to go do outreach in on a monthly basis. Um, those tend to be groups that have a little bit more outreach capacity, but the idea is that many or most tenant organizers identify buildings to go to because somebody walks through the doors of their organization and says there's a problem. Um, and so our goal with the district reports was to build out a list based on um, what is happening in all of these buildings and allow people to cast a broader net and find buildings that where the tenants might not know about their organization. Um, some organizers <laughs> use it as a bit of a monitoring tool to see buildings that they're already in or things happening. Maybe there's a DOB <coughs> stop work order and the owner's not supposed to be doing any construction, but there are new DOB permits. So in some cases, this has allowed um, organizers or legal service providers to figure out when that's going on and can lead to like them going to the judge and fix, getting, I don't know, building on their, um, their like group actions that they might already have going. Uh, the portal serves as this like one-stop shop for all of this different data at a building address and it also has a similar function to the district reports in a, in a bit more of a dynamic way um, where people can have a lot of control over those risk factors that they want to use to find buildings 
um, that they might want to organize. And um, using it in that way uh, is a bit more of like an ongoing training and learning process with organizers um, to be able to, to make that work. Um, and then, yeah, Sam and Mitchell did a great job of talking about challenges, so I will try not to spend too much time on this. Um, these are different tables that you can go through on DAP portal. So we have like HPD complaints and DOD complaints, with, which both originate usually with 311 complaints. But then the agencies like code them in very different ways. So HPD actually has this as two data sets that you then link together and have it like coded into like space type, major category, minor category, and description. Uh, with DOB, you have this one description field, which is <coughs> not necessarily super descriptive of what's happening there. Um, so just very different structures. And that, and it also doesn't necessarily link back to what the 311 complaint was. Um, violations is similar, that you just, the tables look different. You have this um, classification system in HPD violations of A, B, and C, which are meaningful because of city programs designed around them, and you don't have the equivalent in DOB violations. And then you don't just have DOB violations, you have DOB violations and ECB violations, or DOB ECB violations. ECB stands for Environmental Control Board. Um, and so those are a type of DOB violation that carries a penalty and gets adjudicated by oath, which I, I forget what that stands for. Um, but it's an administrative hearing process, and you have these penalties imposed, and the descriptions are different again. So it gets really complicated, and um, for like the end user on the portal, it ends up meaning that even though we're trying to build like a simple story and be like, here's a profile of the building, and here's here it's all in one place, and people really appreciate that, the table structures are still really different. Like it's still very funky for people to go through and make sense of. Um, so that's one of the challenges for our team. Um, another one is uh, DOB has so much data, and so they're what they put out tends to be pretty complex. Um, their old system for filing construction applications involved these job types that were like alteration one, alteration two, new buildings, demolitions, and um, then they are developing a new electronic system. So certain types of permits can be filed on DOB now, or they can be fired, filed the old way. Um, they then the data output is structured differently and doesn't have the same like job type classification um, and has a new system of categorization of what the type of work is. So it's difficult, so we can't really combine the two and we like built that map using uh, a score based on the number of A2 permits and things like that. Okay, um, so we're gonna transition now. Uh, can, <coughs> can you raise your hand if you work at a city agency? Great. Um, and raise your hand if you do data work at a city agency. Cool. Um, so we want to take advantage of who's in the room, um, and we have some discussion questions. So we were hoping we could get into groups of maybe three or four people and spend 10 minutes talking through these questions. So um, we're going to ask you to think of some concrete things that one city agencies could do to facilitate these real world uses of this data. Um, so it might be like ways of structuring the data, ways of publishing it. I actually have no idea. That's why I'm asking you all. Um, what are three things that uh, that do it? The Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, which uh, runs the uh, correct me if I'm wrong, runs the open data portal. Uh, kind of enforces the open data law. Doesn't enforce the open data law. That's Moda. Moda, okay, cool. So let's make this do it and Moda. Um, so, but like the central city entities, which um, try to make sure that our open data works overall, like what could they be doing? And then three things that external users, like us, advocates, or just kind of stakeholders on the outside, what could we be doing to make this all work better? Um, some of these things might require legislation or oversight that doesn't currently happen or money and I don't want you to limit that. One of the things is like legislation can be created by pushes from advocates and we are that so. Um, so we'd love to hear that too. And then in 10 minutes we can reconvene and, and share out what you all came up with. So let's start with the first one. What are three things that city agencies could do to facilitate and support Real world use of their open data. Let's just get a rep from each group. 
talked quite a bit about a lot of things, and none of them were directly pointed at any particular one of these questions. So okay. I think we have a lot of material on this piece of paper that's useful, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't think You don't know what it meant. That, well, yeah, I mean, a lot of it, to say it, we've we we talked right about there. several thousand, yeah, there were several things that we talked about. That was primarily what we were talking about, as far as what are the things that are standing in the way of accomplishing this. Sorry, what, what, what's the thing you mostly there talked about? There a lot about? of challenges. Primarily, that was the discussion. A lot okay. of the reasons. So, um, some agencies aren't don't feel like they can. They would like to publish their data publicly. Uh -huh. but there are a lot of resistance internally, and or I don't know. Well, resistance. So, 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 so um, a lot of data. A lot of the data that we publish as a city is operational data, right? Mm -hmm. And so we, um, and it's easy to take operational data and get it out to the public because we just take it. We, we take. We open up a database view. We just publish it out. But that. In order for that data to be meaningful to the public, there's all kinds of things that, that need to happen, right? Um, because we have a deep understanding of our operational data, the rest of the world doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's easy, like we, I use the example of restaurant inspection data, right? We, part of our workflow is, um, you know, geolocating that data, right? So uh, that, you know, that data uh, is easy for us to expose with geolocators and so on, right? Um, PBLs. Um, our rat inspection data. Um, inspectors are out in the field clicking on maps with BBLs. Like Pluto is on their tablets, right? So, um, and actually we ran into a problem because Moda requested that all the geo, all the data was geocoded, yeah. right? Um, when we take the address data and we put it in on the data set as well, we have the BBL that the inspectors are, are clicking on. So that's highly active. Um, but then when we geocode the address data, yeah. the accuracy level drops down. Yep. And so yep. we ended up making our data less uh, less accurate because we're you know, um, following, we're a adding the geocoding to the process. So there's, you know. So I'm gonna, I'm hearing two things, and then we should we should keep it moving. Um, I'm hearing mm -hmm. that agencies would need to change their workflow mm -hmm. in order to have the operational data that they produce be the same as what mm -hmm. people would want to use on the outside. Like there would need to be an actual change in the mm -hmm. operations. Yes. And then also a challenge being that the centralized regulations around what's required might actually like contradict the usefulness of the data or undermine. Also, yeah. Um, okay, so let's. You'll have more opportunities to share. We're going to go around the room a few times. So does the the group in the back over there want to say anything about about agencies? Um, sure. Uh, so we mostly listened to a lot of concerns from Miss K's from Picture the Homeless. Mm. I work for Department of Homeless Services. Uh, so I'm just going to paraphrase a couple okay. of What a great parent, group parent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there was, there was a series of questions about um, sort of data about shelters, data about uh, the length of stay from shelters, um, housing, how, um, how, what ha types of housing people are placed into, um, how much housing is allocated to, to homeless uh, populations, um, what happened to bat street bathroom programs that were promised at one point and not available now, yeah. um, uh, being told uh, that uh, when they're requesting data to, to FOIL a kind of alternate proposal, alternate paths besides yeah. FOIL, um, information about who's, who's at community board meetings is in this case, it's very hard to find like, backgrounds from yeah. uh, people, and yeah. even just the roll call. Um, and they, sometimes that real estate, people who are, that hides the fact that maybe real estate people, people connected right. to the real estate industry, but the Honorable Tom Use Committee on the yeah. community board. So a whole bunch of series of yeah. things. And, and I, as I was listening to this, I was kind of identifying <coughs> multiple different city agencies. And like I can speak to some of those from yeah. my agency position, but not others. Yeah. And it's kind of hard when you're um, in an advocacy, it can be difficult when you're advocacy community to know who to ask what question. Yeah. And so we have the open data portal or even housing data coalition, but to make sense of the information or know where to ask, um, I, I kind of suggested like a, an ombudsman role or sort of like an interpreter role. And I mean, I know housing data coalition is sort of playing that role, but maybe government needs to do that more. Um, okay, so some uh, like entity or person in government who had have the role of coordinating among agencies and their open data, or what would that what would that role be? I mean, I think it's like if there are questions from advocates and they they're asking a question. Yeah. Um, the 
it's easy to get the bureaucratic runaround of like that's yeah. not my department. Go talk to the other person and like okay, like housing is not my responsibility. I'm Department of Homeless Services. I do serve and like yeah. from an outside perspective, it's like, well, aren't you the people that are supposed to solve homelessness? Yeah. And um, so like being able to interpret and and and, and kind of like a from a customer service perspective yeah. instead of a bureaucratic answer yeah. perspective. I feel like we should write down customer service perspective because I know that three one one has like a. I was trying to aim for that at one point. Um, so let's keep going. Um, there's a group in the middle, one or two groups in the middle. Did you want to add something? I just wanted to add, on the practical end, okay, for somebody trying to figure out what's going on, let's say, with the homeless situation, for example, how do we know, because people are being told to go into shelter and they'll have an apartment or something in three months yeah. or over six months. People are in shelter now for three to four years. Yeah. So the question that I would have in terms of being able to look at the data is how do I look at the data to figure out what is happening, why this is happening, yeah. and where where the, the, the um, obstruction is in terms yeah. of people being able to come out of shelter and to get into housing. Yeah, so there's a transparency issue and um, like access to information on what's happening on an individual basis with the time people are in shelters. And then I heard it somewhere else too, where like the city uh, created legislation where the city was obligated to do something. It hasn't happened or it probably hasn't happened or the data isn't public to know if it's happened. So that's another challenge generally that maybe we can throw up there somehow. Are you capturing? Or is, how's it going? I try. I, <laughs> you're, doing, yeah. you're doing a great it's job. It's kind of, you're not, because I feel like we're identifying like issues versus yeah. uh, solutions, which is totally fine, but they yeah. don't necessarily fall into a bucket. Yeah. Okay. So we will do our best to capture it. And then if you have a way of like translating the challenges you identified into ways of addressing those challenges, that would be excellent. Um, and again, feel free to jot down anything that we're not able to get to in the share because I feel like there, I want to hear everything everybody talked about, um, and we don't have time for that. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next group. Um, so just really simple, might be more the next question, but um, just make open data more easy to navigate. Make um, open, okay, yeah, you know, the portal. Bringing it, yeah, bringing like topic areas like housing together in a way that's more um, navigatable. Um, and then maybe building tools on top of open data, kind of that are more better interfaces, like what Planning Labs has done. Cool. Shout out to Chris. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, great. Um, just adding on to like how to find this data, um, having like links on agency websites to where the open data is, not yeah. only just having like a general gallery on the open data site. Yeah, because those can be really hidden. Some people yeah. have them, but it's not in a clear place on everybody. Yeah, it would be great to standardize that. And then um, if an agency builds a tool or an application, they should be required to use the public data feed or publish the, the, the internal data feed. Because, um, yeah. Otherwise, like, people can't access yeah. what they're using. Right. Should be it. Yeah, that's basically it. Awesome, thanks. Keep going. Anything over here? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I wasn't in the group, but you know, just following up on the idea, if the city would be great, if they publish a report and they have a chart of visualization, it would, it would, it would be great if they standardize on publishing the data behind the visualization as open data, and then linking to that as well. So when they, hmm. so that's creating more, more, more open data, and also like when they do communications, if you use data, also publish the data in open data. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, because we're we're a bit short on time, I think for the next round, let's go through and just share out any other like salient things that came out of your conversation. So we won't try to do it question by question. Um, and uh, yeah, let's go for that. So anything over here on the side of the room? Yeah, we had um, SWAT team or special forces for operational analysis and efficiency. Is that, a, is that yeah? Oh. Okay, like the, yeah, the idea of, of doing being able to like a, a lot of our, our data teams, right? They don't necessarily have the bandwidth to, to offer high quality open data in the way that they could if they had more consulting help. But yeah, and I, I guess you're thinking that should start not just at the high level, like top data, but also on the operations side because often that affects everything downstream. Um, okay, so that would require resources and it would require buy-in mm -hmm. from both the staff 
do it, like the data teams and who else? And the individual agency, right? That, because they would be essentially asking a team to come in and make recommendations. Um, so. so you're thinking of actual like like resources for outside consultants to help <coughs> break, make that happen in an agency? Um, for an agency to be able to consult with do it. So not, uh, not a not a for profit outside consultant, but um, to be able to funding for an additional section in do it that would then help other agencies. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thanks. And then marketing the services that do it already has effectively to all the other agencies. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, anything in that group in the back? I, I think we kind of covered it in our first go. Okay. Great, thank you. Middle? What? Nothing? Okay, cool. Well, I would throw one thing in sort of on top of what you said. As someone who works for municipalities and sits on a co op board and does some volunteering, getting a more external view of all this stuff to me is mandatory, whether it's the UX or just the nomenclature around the stuff. But mm -hmm. to, we're trying to help someone in our building with an artist in residence issue. And I can't even get the answer on what the zoning allows. Or an artist in residence has three names, mm. by the way. So just stuff like that to put like a layer of civilianness on top of all this geekery would be huge. Yeah, I can think of like yeah a couple of things that touches on. So one is that like the open data. Maybe there's a better way of doing this than I know about. But the open data portal has like well over a thousand data sets, um, and it has like browse by agency. But I think that could be a better way for users to understand what it includes in there. Um, and then the zoning issue is like accessibility of the New York City zoning resolution and figuring out what zoning district is assigned to an individual lot, which like New York City planning labs did a lot of work to make that way better, but still extremely convoluted. Okay, um, that, that group over there? Um, so we facilitate committees and users um, and databases, so like a two-way communication not only just the agency publishing data, but um, users that can talk with each other or the agency about what's happening with the data, what has to be improved, um, some improvements to like either the Socrata, like comment section, uh -huh. or just building a whole entire forum and community where oh, yeah. people can talk, and then blogs can be kept for that um, discussion. That would be really great. Yeah, and for anyone who doesn't know, there is a like a formal way of contacting agencies about their open data, you go to the contact us button on Socrata and then it's like ask a question. So it kind of gives the impression, in my opinion, of like just saying that there's like a technical issue wrong with the website. Like I was told that that's how to do it and otherwise I would never have known. But people can be pretty responsive, which is cool. Um, okay, those are really excellent suggestions and I'm really excited to bring these back to the Housing Data Coalition and see what people think. Um, but let's um, let's go on to the other. I don't know if we're going to do general questions or other. I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Uh... Yeah. Is there any questions on the Slido? There are. Okay. All right. I'm gonna take give it to you. Okay, uh, so, oh, you want the actual Slido up? Maybe? No. N no. No? Well. We'll just pull from here. But we're just doing questions, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, who has questions? <laughs> questions, questions for the HDC. Or, about, yeah. Yeah, yeah my name? I have, uh, I'm yeah. Joel. Um, yeah, just a few questions. I'll just lay them all out. I have five, and then two, three, one you can answer. Do you use yeah. GeoClient right now in uh, in the data? In, Maybe in you all want to come up and check. Can, uh -huh. can I take this? Yeah, yeah. Just don't respond to any text messages. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this has the questions on it. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. GeoClient. Are you using NYCD now? We, we use that actually as our primary geocoding service for the addictions data that we had to geocode. Um, but a lot of the data sets we have already have a BBL field in them, so we don't need to like further geocode that. But yes, we use that. But we also use, um, for the, because the, the thing that, that we mainly use, not, 
not NYCDB, um, but a lot of the um, a lot of the services that that we have that are user facing. So the products that ANHB and JustFix build have like an address autocomplete. And um, I think that we used to use GeoClient for that maybe, but now we use NYC Planning Labs as GeoSearch. Um, yeah, in part because it doesn't require any kind of registration or anything. Because I think with GeoClient you have to like register an API key kind of thing or something. Um, and, um, another question? Yeah, yeah I'll yeah. just, just yeah, quick ones. Do you store historical data? You said it's point in time. And if you do, do you allow it to do like longitudinal, like like how what change between say snapshots? Oh yeah, so we do not do any any kind of historical changes in time. So yeah, that that is actually like a current limitation of NYCDB is that some of the sources of data that we get are like like rolling sales and VOF. I think is one of them, and yeah, we just essentially like throw out the old data and put in the new ones. So even though we've had this auto update thing going on for like a year now, um, we haven't been like keeping the historical records of all those rolling sales. We've just been yeah. updating it as new sets come out. So that is a thing that, though that we are that we would like to do, but don't currently do. Um, as so I maintain my own instance of it, and so I like I keep the old stuff myself. Um, oh, yes, we, so we just, just have a lot. We only have a few minutes left because yeah. um, we have a hard stop okay. at 11. So um, any additional questions, get up on the Slido, and we'll make sure to put them in a Google Doc that we share out with everyone. But um, let's just quickly take like one or two more questions because I know it's nearing 11. So I also have the Slido questions. Oh, go for it. But let's take I guess questions first from the uh, anyone? No? Huh? Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to summer. <laughs> Should we? Yeah, well, yeah, sure. Go for it. Okay, so I'm going to try to summarize. There's, there are two questions. One is, does NYCDB have any other data that's not, like, publicly accessible? It, I think it's, it's just the, uh, that rent stabilization data that is um, available at an address called taxbills.nyc, um, and it was scraped and built by John Krauss, and that's the one that's not open data. But that said, all the, it's all pulling from open data sources. Like that's that's where we, we're pulling from the yeah. completely public tax bill PDFs. So yeah. none of it's um, none of it's like private yeah. data. Yeah. Yes. And uh, and what data sets do you not have access to that you would like to have is a bigger question. But definitely those housing court filings. You two have like one wish list. And then the, the tax bill. Uh, I mean, yes. yeah, the uh, rent stabilization numbers. Um, yeah. Basically, when you like go onto the Department of Finance website and search a building. Anything that shows up on that web page, it would be great to have that in a data set, an open data. Everything that the State Division of House, Homes and Community Renewal is in control of, I want to have. So that's like rent regulation, MCIs, individual apartment improvement, it's, the list goes on. Everything about rent regulation in our state. Um, okay, and then there's things about like housing, the housing justice groups that we work with. Do people have data analysts on staff? Um, or are there more needs for that? Uh, how open are groups to um, make it like uh, having data influence the work that they do? Um, do we have challenges with that or lessons? And then I feel like there's what's the most surprising or unexpected way you have seen others build on top of your work? So there's some. I would say people are very are pretty open to it. I mean, I, it's probably self-selecting where the folks who come to us are like organizing groups that are interested in incorporating data into their work. I mean, I think for the most part, um, in terms of outreach, I think like data has been super important to a lot of organizing groups we work with in terms of generating an outreach list based off on some indicators. A challenge though is especially like, you know, we want the meeting, our monthly meetings themselves to include technical folks and organizers and everyone who's both or in between. Um, and a lot of folks who are doing more on the ground work are just super busy and like, like are probably doing something related to their work on like a Wednesday evening. And so, um, you know, and so that that's hard. Like, it would be great to have more folks who are doing on the ground organizing work in the room with us. Um, but it, 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 it's understandably hard for folks to make the time who are in that space. Yeah, I think we do more of that as individual organizations in our like day jobs, mm -hmm. um, where we are resourced to be able to like meet with tenant organizers in these groups rather than uh, in the HDC meeting space. Yeah. Um, do you guys want to, I, th I think that's like the major questions. There are a couple of ones specifically about um, DAP, like DAP portal is it open source? I believe it is. The developer's name is Jade Aking and their company is Data Automatica. 
um, and I would need to find where it exists on GitHub. And oh, what's the best way for someone with technical experience to get involved with helping your work? Just uh, let us know, and you can come to a meeting. <laughs> awesome.